Okay, we're going to get started with this. Now, um, can I just please, let's hope I can connect now. If not, I guess you're going to look at an empty screen. Yay. Oh, Lord. Um, can I get whoever has this um, projector to turn it off and on again? And slash, can I just get it back? Now? I would like it back. Okay, so let's put this before once this is loading. How's it? I don't know who has it, but what do you do? I don't know that. Okay. Um, now, um, let's quickly. You stole it, so she stole it. So the children board has it in your hands. I imagine that it's the case. Boy, can I imagine this bitch? Okay, um, last lesson we talked about the second derivative. How do we find the second derivative? We derive the derivative. Derive the derivative. Derive the derivative. Derive the we, do we differentiate and then we differentiate again. That's how we find the second derivative. Now, what we're going to talk about in this lesson is actually talk about what the, different, the, the second derivative actually means in terms of a graph. Now, first derivative, let's just quickly recap. First derivative, if it is positive, it means that our graph is increasing. increasing. We're going from that. Up that way. If it is negative, it means it's decreasing. It's going back down the other way. And if it's uh, equal to zero, it's at a stationary point. Excellent. Now we also talked about our stationary points. There's three types of stationary points. What's a, what's one of the types? Table at the front here. What's one of the types of stationary points that we have? Local maximum. So on the left hand side you're going up, yeah. and on the right hand side you're going down. Table at the back. Guys. Local minimum. local minimum. So what's different about local minimum? It's yeah, got yeah, the gradient, the derivative, first derivative is going down, so negative, and it goes up, so it's positive at the end. And what's the final one to over here? Horizontal. Horizontal point of inflection. Excellent. So we've got the final one, which is horizontal point of inflection. And what's down in this front table? What's what's the condition for a horizontal point of inflection? Either side, it's the same. Same direction. So that's what we're going to be. That's what we looked at the last couple of lessons. This lesson, we're going to actually start applying that. Okay. So last lesson, we got halfway through an example. So if you turn to page, if you turn to page eleven. Okay, page eleven. We have yes. Can I give that at the end? No. Okay. okay, so we got through half of this example uh, last lesson, and so <laughs> when you've got a quotient, <laughs> uh, when you're doing the quotient rule twice, it looks really messy, and I hate it. Um, but we have to still do it. Um, so here, when we find the first and second derivative, we differentiate once, and we got halfway through differentiating the second time, and we go up to this step. Now, if you have a look at both of my terms in the top and the bottom, for that fact matter. What can, I, what can I do to both the terms in the numerator? What can I take out? Yeah, we can take out 1 plus x squared. What else can we take out from both of the terms? x at the front. So notice here we've got x's here. And we've got, also got this x, come on, work. We've also got this x squared. 1 plus x squared term that we can take out and the boys at the front said 2. We can also take out a 2. I'm going to actually take out a negative 2 from both of them. Makes it a little bit nicer for me. So what am I left with from the first term if I take this out? So if I take out 2x, 1 plus x squared, what am I left with? Oh, I'll give you a second. We need writing time. So we need to just write it. From the first term, if we take out this whole term here, well, we get rid of this negative 2x. We get rid of one of these 1 plus x squared, so we're left with 1 plus x squared. How about the second term? 
Well, first of all, let's check. Is it a plus or minus now? Plus. plus. Why? We took out... Yeah, we've, we've taken out the negative at the front, so we've got plus. What will I be left with? If I take out negative 2, what am I left with? From the second one. 2, yeah. Because if we have a 4 there, it's going to be 2. Bracket. What am I left with from the other term? 1 minus x squared. <laughs> because we've taken it out from... We've, if you have a look, we've taken out this here. We've taken out this here. So we're left with that. Okay, at the bottom, what do we have? 1 plus x squared. Now, if we square a square, what happens to those powers? We... Uh, times them. Uh, yes. We times them. So if you have a to the power m, and we put, raise that to a power n, we multiply the powers together. So here, this one's going to be eight, 1 plus x squared to the power... 4. four. Luckily for us, it wouldn't have made a difference if we added all times, which is just coincidence. Okay. We're almost there. We're almost there. Now, shh. We're almost there. I'll zoom out at the. Is it okay if I zoom out at the end? Okay. Now, we're almost there. We're almost there. Let's quickly. Shh, guys. Let's talk about what we have. So, if you have a look at my top and bottom now, what can I actually cancel out from top and bottom? Yeah. For Chrissy's notice, I've got this 1 plus x squared term at the top here, but we've also got 1 plus x a few times at the bottom. So I can cancel this one out. If I cancel this one, this becomes 3. Excellent. So here at the bottom, I'm going to, now that I've cancelled out, I've got negative 2, and I've got this bracket here. Okay, let's deal with the stuff inside the square brackets. I've got 1 plus x squared. If I open up the second set of brackets here, what will this become? Plus what? 2 minus x squared. So if I simplify this, what do I get? 3 minus x squared. All over 1 plus x squared to the power of 3. Hey, it looked nice in the end. It's not bad. Unzo zooming out. Okay, cool. I'll give you a second just to copy that down. And then we'll flip over the page. Huh? How do we actually get to these? What do you mean get to these? Oh, how do you get to your notes? It is on the one note that is on the Microsoft Teams. So if you remember, so for the people following at home as well, let us go to Microsoft Teams, which is not open. No, definitely not. Slash, I will not answer. But will you get a notification? I will get a notification. And you know what? It's, it's even more satisfying when I hang up. Block all notifications. Block your students. Yeah. Get ready for it. Okay, so, if you remember, oh lord. Um, teams. We can go to. Where am I? Okay, I need to go to. So, if you have a look on our mathematics advanced team. Nope. Okay, so here we have our team. Shh, guys, just a reminder, on our teams, we've got this tab, tab called our class notebook. It takes a long time to load, that is correct. What you can do, what you can also do is once you open it, you can, there's an option here to um, if you have the OneNote app on your device, you can actually open this in your desktop app. And so it makes it a lot quicker to actually look at stuff. So here, once you go there, you go to your uh, content library. And here, you've got all the notes from all the topics that we've done so far. And so here, for example, you can click here and look, we've got our booklet from this topic. Um, it's your own personal stuff. It's whatever you put in there. So that is how you find it. Okay, cool. Now, shh, can we flip over the page to page 12? Quick, take your photo. It, you'll also be able to access this online. Yes. 
I literally showed you how to access it online. <laughs> no, not in not this entire booklet, but this previous booklet. It will cover all the stuff in the previous booklet. I'll tell you which parts we're covering up to. Okay, cool. Flip over the page. We'll do another example of this, and then we will go and talk about what the second derivative actually means for our graphs. So, find the first and second derivatives of f of x is equal to this guy. So I've got this function here. Yeah. Oh, damn. Okay. So, um, oh, and I'll show you a funny example in a moment. Okay, cool. Um, let's find the first and second derivatives of this guy here. So, first derivative, what's the notation for first derivative of a function? F dash x. Excellent. What, what will I need to use to differentiate this guy here? Oh, I realized something that's very smart that I didn't realize the first time. You can use the product rule. A much quicker way of doing this. How can I write um, x to the power, oh, uh, x to the x squared root? And so what does this become? x to the power? Two and a half? Huh? Not three over two. Six, seven. No. No. Five. My brain wasn't Five over two. Yeah. So here, I can use the... I can use my index laws to simplify that. Um, if you use the product rule, also cool. But um, you can actually use the um, product of the index laws to actually help you simplify this and make it easier to differentiate. I didn't do that. If, like, if you have a look at my notes right now, I actually used the product rule twice and that really kills me. I hate it. Um, okay, so. Man, this would have been so much easier. I'm such an idiot. Um, okay, cool. First derivative. What do we get for our first derivative? 5 over 2. 5 over 2. X, X to the power? Negative No. Uh, uh, 3 over 2. 3 over 2. Why is it 3 over 2, boy? Minus 1 whole. Yeah, minus 1 whole. So here, just to remind us, if you're not sure here, if I write 2 as a fraction over 2, that's 4 over 2. Um, and you're adding 1 over 2, which is why we got 5 over 2. And then when we subtract, we subtract 1 every time, which is 2 over 2. Excellent. So that's our first derivative. How do we find the second derivative? Again, yeah, excellent. What's the notation for the second derivative? Two, two, dashes. two dashes. We're now drawing two dashes. And so we differentiate again. So what does this guy become when we differentiate again? Half, the power of half at the end. Excellent. So we've got a power of half at the end. What's going to be at the front? 15 over 4. four. How do you get 15 over 4, TJ? Multiply. Yeah, so can you just write it? What would the working out look like? Uh, 5 over 2 times 3 over 2. Yeah, excellent. So we're bringing down the powers every time. And so here we've got yeah. 5 over 2 times 3 over 2. Bring TJ. And here we get, as TJ said, 15 over 4, x to the power half. There we go. That's really nice for us. Okay. There we go. Okay. Let's go through this example. Example 10. That's it. That's it. That one was really simple because we noticed a quick trick and we don't have to use the product rule. If you did notice a quick trick and you used the product rule, you would still get, I think, a similar answer. Okay. Let us move to the next one. Okay. Find the first, second, and third derivatives of x to the power n and find the nth and nth plus 1 derivatives of n, uh, x to the power n. Okay, this is, this, is, this is an interesting one. Here we go. Okay, so, so let's go through this one. This one, I'm differentiating x to the power n. Hey, shh. So here, let's differentiate x to the power n. What do we get? Guys, shh. When we differentiate x to the power n, what do I get? N. X. A minus 1. Excellent. Cool. Let's find the second derivative. So here I'm going to go d squared on dx squared. x to the power n. That's the second derivative. Same notation. What do I need to do to find the second derivative? I? Derivative of the first guy. So what will I get if I differentiate the first guy? Yeah, I'm going to write in a different order. I'm going to write it in the 
n times n minus 1. Are you cool with that? Yeah. Yep. x to the power, what's the power now? We've got n minus 1 minus 1, which would give you n minus 2. Okay? Let's find the third derivative. I'm going to write d3 to over dx cubed, x to the power n. What would the third one be? Because it says the first, second, third. So what's the third one going to be? Guys over here, what's the third derivative going to look like? It's going to... n. n minus 1. N minus two, thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, what what do we notice about that? Hopefully, you're starting to see pattern. Pattern, right? Pattern. Everyone see pattern? Okay. So, if I was to do this the nth time, so I'm gonna write. Oh lord, I hate this notation. Um, instead, I'm gonna actually just use f n notation because I can't be bothered now. Um. So that's the nth derivative. What would the nth derivative look like? No, because it's limited. N is limited. So if we kept differentiating this n times, what would that actually look like? Um, it would have n. N. And then bracket n minus one, n minus two. And so on until what would be the last? N. N minus. No. Have a look at all the previous ones. What's the last term here? So this one, we had n for the first one. This one for the second derivative, we had n minus 1. The third one, we had n minus 2. n minus... It's not n minus... M? M for m and m's. No. n minus... 0. No. N minus Okay, hang on, hang on. If this is... Okay, this is my first derivative. This is my second derivative. Thank you. Oh. You're so big for you. Did you guess that? No. Have a look at the pattern here. Have a look at the pattern. Look at, okay, this is my first derivative. That first part is, and we can kind of treat this n as n minus zero. This is my second derivative. Guys at the front table, shh. I have n minus one. My third derivative, I have n minus two. Yeah? So what do you notice about the relationship between the derivative number and the number at the end here? It's, it's minus one. It's like keeps decreasing, but it's like every time it's like one less, right? Do you notice it's like one less? So here to get from, to get this number here, it's two minus one. This number here was three minus one. So if I did the fourth one, so let's say I did the fourth one, it'd be n, n minus one, n minus two times what? n minus three, which is a, how, what, what, how would I write? X Which is my... And then it's x to the power what? N, n minus four. minus 4. The pattern here for the other the power is just that. So here, I've got something else here. x to the power n minus what? Uh, n. n. What's n minus n? Zero. zero. What's x to the power 0? It's just one. Nothing. It's oh. just a thing. That's it. That's it. So is this, does this term have any x's in it? No. So if I differentiate this again, n plus 1th derivative. Hey, this is part of the question. If I differentiate this again, what would happen? Why? Because there's no x. There's no x. If it's no x, it's a constant. If we differentiate a constant, what happens? So that's why the nth plus 1 derivative is just going to be 0. That's crazy. That's crazy. This guy, um, this guy here, I believe, is uh, n, n minus 1, like n minus 2, oh god, uh, all the way to 1. Um, people who did extension, does anyone remember what this guy can be rewritten as? If I do n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 times, all the way to 3 times 2 times 1. Oh. Oh. Sorry to ruin the minds oh. of all the people who did extension. Oh my god. It's n factorial. Yay! Okay, flip the page! I stopped. Get off your phone, boy. I'm looking at my really teams. Uh, 
I'm also going to download Teams. Stop, you do that after class. Hang on. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. N plus. <laughs> That's not like Clash, right? Don't lie. <laughs> get him, Carl. Get him. Get him. Get him, Carl. Get him. Okay. Once you are ready, can you please look at page thirteen? Once you're ready, can you please turn to page 13? Yes, you do. I just studied last period. Shh. Really? Yes. Shh. Shh. Okay. Page 13. Page 13. Okay. Page 13. Now that we've done the second derivative, so all of the last, les last lesson at the end when we started looking at the second derivative, we actually just looked at how do we actually get to the second derivative. So second derivative, we just differentiate the first and get the first derivative and then differentiate that again. I will set. Um, I will just get you to do specific ones from it. Give me a moment to do. Look at that now. Points of inflection. Now, in the twenty nineteen syllabus, it was spelt differently. Let's ignore that. Um, okay, cool. So, because people want to spell it correct. Um, okay, now, if you remember, at the beginning of this lesson, I talked about the first derivative. And there was three conditions on my first derivative, which was when it's greater than zero, equal to zero, or less than zero. And we said, increasing that, increasing. guys, shut First derivative means that the graph is increasing. We're going increasing. If it's equal to zero, it is stationary. It's flat. And if it is less than zero, it is decreasing. So that's the implications of our first derivative. If it, te it tells us if our graph is increasing, stationary, or decreasing. So like kind of the direction it's going. Now that we're talking about our second derivative, f double dash x, we've also got similar conditions, but now it tells us something different. It tells us something different. Now, if you have a look here, we've got definition five. So a cave, what the second derivative actually tells us is about the concavity. So that's this big word up here. Concavity of our graph. So if you remember when we looked at quadratics, yep, what TJ said was right. When we looked at quadratics, we talked about something being concave up or concave down. Concave up or concave down. This is a very similar thing. So a curve concaves up at a point x is equal to a when the second derivative at that point is positive. So if our second derivative is positive, so I'm just going to, if second derivative is positive, so here f double dash of a is greater than zero. That's what it is. If our second derivative is positive, it means it concaves up. So it has this smiley face thing. So this whole section, it's not just the part which is decreasing. So notice here, I've got the left-hand side is decreasing, right? So the first derivative is less than zero. And on the right-hand side, the first derivative is greater than zero, right? Everyone cool with that? What this actually means is this whole section, this whole section actually has a second derivative of greater than zero. This whole part, notice it's concave up, it's smiley face. So concave up just tells us if that it is, um, what's it called, that it is concave, oh, second derivative is positive just means it's concave up, smiley face. So in the same way, it's pointing down if the second derivative is negative. negative. So here, this whole second graph, f dash, double dash of x, the second derivative is less than zero. The second derivative is ne negative, means it is frowny face. So here, there we go. Less than zero. Excellent. Now, this has a few consequences for our stationary point. So just remind me, what does it mean for something to be stationary? Flat. What does it mean, like, algebraically? What's equal to zero? F dash x is equal to zero. So we can find our stationary points. And you notice last lesson, when we were trying to determine the nature, we drew up that table, right? We drew up that table and went, like, we have x, f dash of x, and we had f of x. And we just drew, like, at a particular point, it had zero, and it was, like, going up and going down, which meant that at that particular point, if it was going up and then going down, it meant that it is, is it a local maximum or local minimum? Yeah. Maximum. This was a max. 
And we, using that, we actually determine the nature. Using our concavity, we can actually determine the nature as well. Because if you have a look, if we have a stationary point when it, the, um, the second derivative is positive. So here, positive means it's concave up. If we have a stationary point down here, what do we know about that stationary point? What type of turning point is that? Local minimum. So here, if our graph is concave up, so here, F, uh, we will have a local minimum. Minimum. So this is when we have F dash X is equal to zero and our second derivative is greater than zero. So if our second derivative is greater than zero, it means it's concave up. And we add on top of that that, that we, the first derivative is equal to zero, we've got a local minimum. Yeah, and the other one is a local maximum. So if our f dash x is equal to zero, so it's once again stationary, but our concavity this time is less than zero, which means it means concave down, that's a maximum. Because if you look at my diagram up here, our second derivative is less than zero, it means it's frowny face, so there's a top point up there. Are we cool with that? This actually helps us to do determining the nature question. So if they ask you to determine the nature and you don't need to sketch the graph later on, doing this is just going like, you can actually sub in your stationary point into your second derivative and they'll tell you maximum or minimum. That's what it is. Okay, cool. So changing cavity. Now, I didn't notice when we talked about the first derivative, um, we said that if it was greater than zero, it's increasing, less than zero, it's decreasing. And if it's equal to zero, it's a stationary point. I haven't said anything about the second derivative being equal to zero. Now, usually, here's where it talks about. So, point of inflections occur when the concavity of the curve changes. So, point of inflection happens when the concavity changes. So, it goes, so points when the graph goes from concave up to suddenly going concave down, this moment here is a point of inflection. We're going to draw that underneath, so you don't need to draw this one. Now, from concave up to concave down and vice versa. Now, all points of inflection have this property of f double dash x is equal to zero. So our second derivative is equal for, to zero for all points of inflection. This is where I want you to be very careful. Wait, what did you say? So all points of inflection have a second derivative of being equal to zero. So notice here, all points of inflection. So when it changes, it's the second derivative. No. What does that mean? So when the second derivative, so all points of inflection, if you have a point of inflection at that particular point, the second derivative will be equal to zero. I'm saying no for a very specific reason. Because the opposite is not true. So here we're saying that all points of, if we have a point of inflection, that means that the second derivative at that point is equal to zero. The reverse is not true. I cannot say that a point of, uh, if the second derivative is equal to zero, we've got a point of inflection. And I'll give you a good example of this. Um, I'm going to draw this graph for you. Y is x to the power 4. It looks like this. Actually, before I do that, draw four examples of points of inflection. I'm going to show you four points of inflection. We've actually talked about two of them, actually. What was the third type of... Yeah, excellent. So one of them looks like this. So one of our examples of points of inflection is our horizontal point of inflection. It's this guy here. Because at this particular point here, notice on the left hand side, if I just look at the left hand side, what type of concavity is it? Is it concave up or concave down on the left hand side? Yeah. Down. Notice it's a frowny face. It will make like a frowny face if I continue drawing that frowny face. On the right hand side, what's a concavity? Oh. oh. So that's a point of, example of a point of inflection. And similarly, you have the opposite version where you go in the opposite direction like this. On the left hand side, we've got concave up. And then suddenly at this point, we've got concave down on the other side. Now, the other type of, uh, the, uh, there's two more versions of points of inflection. And it's points of inflection where we actually rotate this 90 degrees. So here, this one is one where we look like this. So at this particular point, Notice here, is that point in the middle a stationary point? No. no. It has a gradient, it's a positive gradient. 
At this point here, what do we notice about the left-hand side? Is it concave up or concave down on the left-hand side? Concave up. Oh, yeah, this side is concave up, and on the right-hand side, it's concave yeah. down. So this is another example of a point inflection, and the final one is basically like the reverse version. So I'm going this way. And similarly, we've got concave down, and then concave up. So that's our points of inflection. So these are like the four types of points of inflection that you'll notice in a graph. Now, what I said was at all these points, at all these points, the second derivative is equal to zero. But just because you have a second derivative being equal to zero, it doesn't mean that your graph has a point of inflection. And the example of this, and it's in that important note, that's an example is x to the power of four. So what I'm going to do on the right-hand side here, I'll give you a second to copy that down, and I'm going to just do on the right hand side here. I'm going to have y is equal to x to the power 4 f double dash. Sorry, I'll write a little bit clearer. So all of these we have the second derivative is equal to 0. Okay, can someone help me out? What do I get when I differentiate x to the power 4? Four? 4x cubed. And if I differentiate again, what do I end up getting? Okay, when is 12x squared equal to zero? When x is equal to what? Zero. zero. Are we cool with that? Mm. Now, when you draw the graph of x to the power of four, it actually looks something like this. It looks like a parabola, but it's just a little bit fatter, that's all. He's a thicker boy. It looks like this. Now, that's x is equal to zero is all the way down here. Now, can someone tell me, on the left-hand side of that point, what's the concavity? Left hand side is up. Everyone see that? This side is concave up. How about the right hand side? Is it concave up or down? Oh. Up. Is this a point of inflection? No. no. Concavity hasn't changed. The concavity hasn't changed. Here we've actually shown that the second derivative is equal to zero. So here at x is equal to zero, it's equal we have a second derivative of equal to zero. Zero, right? But this is not a point of inflection. Not P O I. Not a point of inflection. So just because you've shown something has a second derivative of equal to zero doesn't automatically mean that it's a point of inflection. You actually need to check with your first derivative that it does go one, as in like, it goes from one direction to the other. Yeah. So, yep. Would that be for all parabolas? Would that be for all parabolas? Yeah, it'll also be for parabolas. So x squared, at the turning point, you'll have a second derivative of equal to zero, but you won't have a turning point, you won't have a point of inflection. And similarly for like any even powers of x. When you graph them out, it will not give you that thing. Is everyone cool with that? Yeah. Um, T. So, with, so like with the examples mm -hmm. that you've given over there, yep. the four of them, yep. uh, you say that um, f double dash mm -hmm. x equals to zero. Yep. Uh, what equals to zero exactly? So the second derivative. You find the second derivative and you sub in the x value at this given point. So like I sub in, like let's say this is a, this is a, this is a, and if I had to change it, that would mean that I need to sub in f of f double dash of a is equal to zero. The first derivative doesn't have to equal to zero. The first derivative doesn't have to equal to zero, correct. Um, the thing that you need to check actually, if you want to make sure that the derivative, the, it is actually a point, uh, that is actually a point of inflection is that either side you've got a um, concavity change. So you want to check on one side, you've got f double dash x is greater than zero, and on the other side, you've got f double dash x is less than zero. That's what you want to check for point of inflection. And we'll actually go through a few examples of this. We've talked about this guy here. This is your favorite friend, horizontal point of inflection. That look cool? Okay, let's have a go at these examples from the 2007 HSE exam paper. Use the second derivative, if possible, to determine the nature of stationary points of this graph here. So, here we go, okay. What we're going to do, we want to, let's just do this first part. So we want to determine the nature of stationary points of this particular graph. And then after that, what else do we need to do in this question? So keep reading on. So find any points of inflection, examine the concavity over the whole domain and sketch the curve. So we want to find points of inflection and examine concavity and then sketch curve. Now, what I'm going to do to show you this is I'm going to do a few different things. So. Let's first do this. So what do I need? What do you reckon I need to do first if I'm trying to answer this question? Differentiate. differentiate. Whenever they're trying to get you to determine stationary points, you need to differentiate. 
So let's differentiate. Let's find the first derivative. I'm going to just write my function here. f of x is equal to x to the power 4 minus 4x cubed. I've got my function here. Let's differentiate that. So when I differentiate it, what do I end up getting? 4x cubed? 12x squared. 12x squared. Excellent. Everyone cool with that? Mm -hmm. To help, huh? We'll get there in a moment. I'm going to actually, um, I'm going to differentiate this again in a moment, as Shahad said, because we want to find the. Yeah, both are saying very good things. Excellent. Um, so I will differentiate again in a moment to find the second derivative. And I'm actually going to differentiate this guy because it's going to be a lot easier to. But as Prakriti said, I'm going to factorize this as well because when I factorize it, what, can it, what will it help me find? X's. X's. What, when with points when it's going to be x is equal to, oh, f dash x is equal to zero, which means my stationary points. Stationary points. So turning points are specific, specific stationary points. So we just want to find the stationary points. Just the language thing. Stationary points. So turning points, so remember with your stationary points, there's three types of stationary points. All three of these are stationary points, but only the first two are turning points. Because if you have a look, this third one doesn't really turn. It just keeps going in the same direction. This one, it changes. And this one also changes. Is that? Okay, cool. I'm going to factorize this. Let's factorize this guy. What can I, how can I, fact, what can I factorize that? I've taken a 4 for you. 4x squared. Okay, cool. What am I left with? X minus 3. Okay, so with this, therefore, my stationary points, where are my stationary points at? 0. X equals 0. X equals 3. Okay, cool. I've got those points. Okay. Now that I've done that, um, what we can do is... Uh, let's just leave it that. Okay, cool. Next thing that we did, as Shahad said, we're going to differentiate again. Now, once I've... Just have a look at the two things I found here. It's going to be a lot easier to differentiate this guy here, right? Everyone cool with that? Yeah. It's a lot easier to differentiate this guy as opposed to the guy underneath because I would need to use the product rule. I'd rather just differentiate that guy because it's a lot easier. Let's differentiate again to find our second derivative. So, let's... We get 12x squared... Yep. 24x. Minus 24x. Okay. I can also factorize this, but and I'll do I'll do it underneath. Let's just factorize it. What do I end up getting? Oh. Bracket. <laughs> Thanks, CJ. Thank you. I I didn't hear that. Let's just pretend we didn't hear that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Now. Um, stationary points, just remember with points, um, so we've differentiated once, we differentiate again to find the second derivative. I'm going to jump back to the first deriv der derivative. Um, stationary points, what do points need? A y value. We need two coordinates. So here we've only just found the x coordinates of my points. What do I need to do to these two values? I need. Yeah, we need to sub it back into our original equation. So here I'm going to do it underneath. f of 0 will give me what? Zero and f of three will give me oh god oh lord oh lord eighty one minus negative twenty seven. You lost to seven somehow. Come on, boy. I think it's negative twenty seven. Yeah, it's right. Negative twenty seven. So my two stationary points are at zero zero and three negative twenty seven. Are we cool with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Cool. Okay. Now, this last lesson, when we wanted to determine the nature, we drew up that table, right? And then we could, like, determine the signs. You don't need to do it for this example because I'm going to show you what you can do. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my two x values that I got here and sub it into my second derivative. Because if you remember, if the second derivative is positive, it means that we are concave up. And that means we have a local... What's a... Minimum, because it's the bottom. If it's negative and concave down, maximum. we have a local maximum. So let's sub in my two second derivatives. So here, let's go. F double dash zero is equal to, what do I get when I sub in zero into my second derivative? 
Zero. Excellent. Everyone cool with that? Okay, cool. Sub in, F double dash, three in. What do I end up getting? 36, excellent. Now, I'm gonna check the three one first because the zero one is gonna be a little bit more difficult. Okay? Have a look at the three one. Is that, po when we subbed in three into my second derivative, did we get a positive or negative value? Positive, which means it is concave what? Up. So, what does that mean about three negative 27? Is it a local minimum or local maximum? Yeah, local minimum. If you can't remember which one it is, just draw yourself. Okay, go concave up. Okay, cool. I've got concave up, which means I'm happy face. Because it's happy face, if I have a stationary point, where's the stationary point going to be? At the bottom. Is that local minimum or maximum? Minimum. That's how you can remember that. Yeah? Everyone cool with that? Okay, now, we have got a pretty bit of a problem though. The other one. F double dash is equal to zero. Now, it's not a local minimum, it's not a local maximum because we don't have any of those conditions. Yeah. So here, this means it's a horizontal point of inflection because HPOI, because we've got that it's a horizontal there and it's a horizontal point of inflection. Now, in addition to that, what you'd like to check is that on either side of zero, you've got a change in the, what's it called? Local. You've got a change in the second derivative. So I'm just gonna ch quickly check this. So if I sub in something on the negative side of zero, if I sub in something from the negative side of zero, so what's a number that's negative from zero on the left-hand side of zero? Negative one. Negative one. If I sub it into my second derivative, what do I get? Positive, positive right? Yeah. That's positive. If I sub in a number on the other side, so one, is it positive or negative? Negative, negative right? So I sub it in, I get positive, negative. Well, but is, a, is that kind of like an outlier? Because if you sub in three, it wouldn't be negative. So three is because why is it three? Why is three a con. Because it's the egg. It's after two, right? Yeah. So we just want something between zero and two, and we're going to go through that in a moment. But because notice here on like immediate either side of zero, we've got like a change, right? It goes from positive to negative. That means we've got a concavity change, which means we have indeed a point of inflection. This is what you need to do to actually check that it is a point of inflection. Are we cool with that? Okay, cool. So we've determined the nature by actually using the second derivative. The second derivative can help us determine the nature and we don't need to draw up that table of values. We're gonna still do it anyway because it helps us draw the graph in a moment. Um, but yes, does everyone see that how the second derivative can actually help you determine nature? So particularly in questions when you don't ask, they don't ask you to sketch. For this one, we do need to sketch, so it will be nice to draw the table. If they don't ask you to sketch the curve, if the question was just like, uh, determine the nature of the stationary points and don't need to sketch, you can use a second derivative to help you do that. It's really nice because you can just sub values in and you go, oh, cool. It's positive, it's negative, it's a local minimum, local maximum. Yeah? If you would like to do the table, that's cool too. You'll get marks for that as well. But it's just using the second derivative is quite easy to do that. That's what I'm saying. It's confusing. It's confusing? Sure. If you find it confusing, you can draw up the table and it's like quite a lot nicer. Yeah. So when we use this method, when it's like You don't need a sketch. Oh, yeah. So, so, so if it just says determine the nature, it's a lot quicker to just do this because you don't need to do all these substitutions, right? But if you find that the table of values helps you quite a little bit more and you're like, oh, is this, one, this method is too confusing, use the table of values. I'm more than happy for that. Okay, cool. Okay. We still need to do the table. We will do that in a moment. Now, we've done the first part. We've determined the nature. What's the second part of this question asked me to do? Any we need to find any points of inflection. So that's what we're going to do now. Now, with any points of inflection, so for the points of inflection, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a separate table of values to the ones that we would regularly do for the previous one. Point of inflection. What I'm going to do, normal table of values, we had F, uh, X, and then what was underneath X? F dash X, the first derivative, and then in the third row we had F of X, the original function. 
Just to check for points of inflection. So part two, points of inflection, the table of values you really want is just f of x and f dash of x. That's the two things you really need in this to check points of inflection. Because we're just changing, checking if there's a concavity change. Is that double dash? Double dash. Double dash. Let me just write here. You just want to have the second derivative. Okay. Now, just like we did with the first one, um, what, you, what we want is we want to put our zeros in and put dots either side. Now, where are the two zeros of my second derivative? No, second derivative. Second derivative? Where are the zeros for my second derivative? Not three. Zero and two. Because your second derivative is up here. So your second derivative, we've got here, the two points that we're looking for is x is equal to zero and x is equal to two. So this is for my second derivative only. So it's going to be zero and two. And we know that the second derivative is zero at those points. And we want to do the dot, dot, dots either side, dot, dot, dots either side, dot, dot, either side. Now we've already checked zero, right? So on the negative side of zero, we know that it is positive. And on the right hand side of zero, it is negative. negative. All we want to do is check two and see if there is a point of inflection there. So what's another, what's a number that I can sub in for the next part? Yep. Cool. Three. We'll sub three into my second, second derivative. Sub in three into my negative second. 36, which is? So is x is equal to a positive, uh, is x is equal to, uh, is x is equal to two a negative. point of inflection? Negative. Is this one here a point of inflection? Yes. Yeah, it goes from negative to a positive, which means, is it a point of inflection? Yeah. What you want to check is that on either side, you've got a sign change. If on the other side, this was negative, is our point of inflection? No. It needs to be have a sign change. I keep getting emails. I hate all those emails. Okay, cool. So my points of inflection are at my points of inflection are at zero, zero, which was what we found originally here. And x is equal to two. Now, now we need to find the y x equal to two. How can I find the y value of x equal to two? Sub into which one? Uh, I've got three things I can sub it into now. So this was minus or it was No. The first one. Original function. Because we want to find the y value. So let's just. So let's just remind. F of x. If you're subbing into here, you're finding y values. If you're subbing into f dash of x, you're finding the gradient at a point f double dash of x, you're finding the concavity. I'll give you a moment to write it. Um, when I sub it in, I believe you get 16 minus 32. Point of inflection, 2, negative 16. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool. Now, using all of this information, we can actually start to graph our function. Just for the sake of um, completeness, let's just fill in our regular table of values. So here we're gonna have x, f dash of x, and f of x. What am I gonna put in, the, uh, in here for my um, Table values for two. Guys, two. I'm going to fill in my original table of values that we did last lesson. What are the values I'm going to put in here? Zero, zero, and three. three, and we've got dot 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 to either side, dot 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 to either side. I know at those points they're stationary points. I've got zeros as their um, first derivative. What's the second? Well, we've also found what f of x is because at zero we have a y value of zero, and at three we've got a y value of negative twenty-seven. Now let's just check our first derivative stuff. So on the left hand side of zero, what's the number that I can sub in for the left hand side of zero? Minus one. Minus one. Sub in into my first derivative. Is it going to be positive or negative? Minus one into my first derivative. We want to sub in something in here, right? 
So we want to sub in like minus one to my first derivative. Negative. So sub it into my first, uh, what's it called, my first derivative. If I sub in negative one into this guy here, is negative, excellent, okay, I think it's negative two. So it's negative, so that means on my graph, what's it gonna look like? We're going down, so I'm gonna draw an arrow down. Sub in the number between zero and three into my first derivative, what's the number between zero and three? One, what direction is it? What do you guys think? No, we're subbing into we're subbing it into the first derivative. Notice here, you look at the col look at the row you're in. We're in this row here. Negative. It's going to be okay. Who thinks it's positive for the next part? Who thinks it's negative? Yeah. It's negative. Yeah. Negative here, so it means it's going down. And then we've already so here's the thing, right? We've already actually determined some of this from the first part. We, it's going to be positive for this next part. Next lesson, we'll finish off the graph and then go through a few more examples. Uh, and I'll see you guys tomorrow, period two.